vent louvers in the hood are accented by uh, stainless pieces under the General Motors truck insignia. Uh, so they did do things uh, to GMC to differentiate it from the shared Chevrolet components that it used. That's correct. Thank you for bringing it around again this year. Thanks very much. He's a regular with us. We're getting a 60 ahead of a 56, huh? Okay, next up is a 1960 Ford F100 brought in by Stephen and Jesse Dage of Bingham Farms, Michigan. Uh, this truck marks the fourth year that, sh that Ford used this body design. Uh, it was introduced originally in 1957 and it was continued on a carryover basis until the new truck came over in 1961. Uh, you'll notice that the cab has a forward slant uh, to the vent windows and to the roof line. Uh, kind of makes it look like it's eager to go. And uh, it also features a wrapper on windshield and in this case, uh, the windshield is tinted, which was an option. And uh, you'll notice also that it has a style side bed. Uh, that means that the sides of the bed come out evenly with the cab sides. So you get a wider bed as opposed to the narrow beds that they had before this design came out in 1957. Uh, Ford kind of pioneered this design and uh, the other manufacturers followed suit afterwards. Yes, sir. Uh, the uh, custom or upscale cab available this time had a uh, wrap around uh, full width rear window and bright moldings around the windshield. We also notice that this uh, truck has bright hubcaps, which probably came from a 47 or 48 Ford car because uh, starting with the Korean War, they started to paint the uh, hubcaps on these trucks with aluminum paint, but most restorers do like these people did and they sort of uh, jazz it up a little bit. I'll bet they are. Huh? You don't? They have one original. Oh, okay. okay. The owner says they're very hard to find. Yeah. Three more, let me know. <laughs> Probably not by the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> very good, Roger. Okay, thank you again. Thanks very much. Sounds like a six. Well, <clears throat> I guess this is a technically a commercial vehicle, even though it started life as a sedan. It's a 1940 Studebaker Champion taxi cab. The Studebaker, uh, in an attempt to uh, save its, itself from the uh, effects of the Depression, announced a lower-priced car in 1939. The Champion was an immediate success and this represents the first uh, update of that car uh, with the sealed beam headlamps and a slightly changed grille. It had a small inline six-cylinder L-head engine, I believe of 80 horsepower. Maybe it was as low as 78, but something in that range. And uh, not surprisingly, taxi cab operators did buy these cars because they were economical to operate. Yeah, it was said that the Studebaker Champion could get up to 27 miles per gallon, uh, which was pretty big news in 1940. Um, the design was um, originated by Raymond Lowy. Um, Studebaker commissioned Raymond Lowy Studios to do their design work um, in the late 1930s and throughout the 50s even. Uh, so it was done on a commission basis. Um, this Studebaker was brought in by Larry and Pat Garden of Quincy, Michigan. And uh, it was a pretty unusual car. And uh, a lot of the taxis seen in cities at this time were Chrysler products, generally DeSotos. And uh, it's very unusual to see a Studebaker version of this um, in the correct livery. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of a neat car to see. Thanks very much for bringing it by. Well, what are we going to have now? Oh, okay. 
We have a 1953 Cadillac hearse brought. It's a Eureka conversion from uh, a fl uh, it is a flower car. That's right. Only the uh, most upscale funeral homes had flower cars. And Eureka, as I recall, was built in Illinois, right? Rock Falls, Illinois, yeah. Uh, yes, this flower car is actually a dual purpose. Um, it can actually be used as a hearse, I think. And the rear uh, compartment is hydraulically operated. Uh, so it's, a, it's kind of a versatile car for the funeral homes that were able to use it. Um, Tom's going to demonstrate um, how it works hydraulically. So the flowers would be put on at an angle, so when you're in the procession, they wouldn't blow all over. It kind of protects them, and it also gives them display room. And when it's up, it can be used as a funeral car because there are rollers to slide the casket in and out. Uh, so it's an unusual design. Like Jim said, it wouldn't be seen at every funeral home, um, but the most upscale ones. Um, Eureka kind of integrated their commercial design with Cadillac styling. So you'll see that it does have the uh, Cadillac fins, uh, which were just starting out at this time and also has a modified Cadillac sedan roof line. Uh, so it's unusual because it doesn't have a cab-like affair or a squared off rear, but it has a backlight from a conventional sedan. Uh, so it looks very sleek and uh, it's very unusual. Uh, Cadillac built commercial car chassis and they generally used it for what they called professional cars. Um, these are cars that were converted to hearses, and they were supplied to area funeral homes throughout the country. And ambulances yeah, as ambulances well. Ambulances were based on uh, that chassis until the modulars came along in the, uh, in the late 60s, as I recall. The minivan started it, and then uh, as ambulances became more rolling hospitals, they needed more room than you could get with a... Uh, Cadillac uh, commercial chassis conversion. Okay. And, and this funeral car was brought in by Tom Hutchek from Fort Wayne, Indiana. He's Long time motor muster participant. That's right. Good, good to yeah, see you back yep. this year. Next up, we have a 1956 Ford F-350, brought in by Kathy and John Boyer, in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, this is a stake body, which has the wooden framework in the back. Uh, it's a general purpose truck, uh, very handy in farm usage. Um, it's got a longer wheelbase than the conventional pickup, which I think at that time, Jim, had about a 112-inch wheelbase. Well, that would, you're talking in terms of a half-ton pickup. Now, Ford made a an F-350 pickup that would have had the same wheelbase as this, which, uh, as I recall, is 130 inches. And uh, the uh, 56 model Ford truck was distinguished by the uh, wraparound windshield that was, uh, uh, Ford had to join the uh, world with wraparound windshields in their trucks and in, 55 General Motors had completely new trucks that had wraparound windshields and wraparound rear windows and Dodge came along in the uh, middle of 55 and put a wraparound windshield into its trucks and Ford got there as quickly as they could with the truck you see here. Nevertheless, these, po these trucks were quite popular and they had an extended uh, model year that ran from about September of 55 to into uh, calendar 57. So uh, that was one uh, line of trucks from that era where Ford outsold Chevrolet. Yeah, styling was getting very competitive during the 1950s for trucks as well as for cars. Uh, so it's kind of unusual that you would do a major rework to install that wraparound windshield in a cab that's destined to be changed the next model year. 
Um, this is the last iteration of this design that Ford had, which was initially introduced in 1953, and uh, it was a very popular um, configuration. Yeah, Thanks wrap, for Wraparound windshields sort of ended up being a fad, but at the time, uh, they were just about, you had to have a wraparound windshield or else. Or you couldn't play. That's right. Uh, and also, this is the first year that Ford trucks went to a 12-volt system. So it gave you a little bit more electrical power, and they did the same for their passenger cars as well. Yeah. Well, the industry switched. Uh, General Motors led the way, but the industry was fully switched uh, to 12 volts by 56, except maybe some of the minor producers. And still is today. Yep. Okay. Thanks very much. My, one of the BBs. Well, this will end up being probably the oldest truck we're going to see. It is a 1934 Ford Model BB dump truck. It is a V8 powered by the 221 cubic inch Ford V8 engine that uh, was rated at 90 at 80 horsepower for trucks and uh, they proudly uh, marked the V8 uh, engine on the hood side and if it was one of the rare models with the four cylinder engine the numeral four was located where the V8 is there uh, there's a hydraulic dump which is something that was coming into use in the 30s but it was not all that common at the time. Uh, this truck was brought in by Brett and Kim Worsler of Oxford, Michigan. And by 1934, as Jim pointed out, Ford was kind of phasing out its four-cylinder engine application. When they first introduced the V8 in 1932, they hedged their bets by offering both the V8 and the old four-cylinder, which was updated. Um, but for car and truck use, the V8 was the overwhelming choice. In fact, the catalog that year for the truck says nothing takes the place of power. So Ford, Ford was big on promoting the power of the V8. And as Jim also pointed out, they wanted to promote it by having it on the hood sides. Uh, Ford cataloged their own dump body in 1934, but I think this is a Gar Wood it is. dump body. So this, this is what we would call aftermarket today. Uh, but Ford was also kind of getting out of their own body business and kind of leaving it to the aftermarket um, during this period. Yeah, the wood uh, dump body was uh, invented, or the company was run by Gar Wood, who made his fame as a racing boat. Uh, he made his money with hydraulic dump trucks, but he spent it on boat racing and that's how everybody knew him, was by, uh, by his escapades on the water rather than what was making him his money. Thank you for bringing it by again. Thank you. Well, we go to the other edge of the spectrum. We sure with do. This. Uh, this would be a 1951 Crosley brought in by Zach Roman of New Middleton, Ohio. Uh, Crosley was a producer of small vehicles. I guess we could eventually call these subcompacts, but this was even smaller than a subcompact car. But I thought the ironic thing about Crosley was that Powell Crosley was a man that was over six foot tall and he yet promoted these small cars. Uh, Crosley made his money in the 1920s by making radios, and he also branched out to making refrigerators later on. And he's the one that came up with the idea of putting shelves in the door of the refrigerator. Uh, and Crosley called this the shelvador. Uh, but when he turned his attention to cars, he really made something different. And the strange thing about him, if Roger hadn't mentioned it while I wasn't paying attention, he was not a little guy. He was like six foot four, 
and he probably, his personal car was probably a Cadillac, but uh, anyway, he did, uh, he did make a, uh, a name for himself in these smaller cars. There were two generations of them. The first ones before World War II had two-cylinder engines, and then uh, they moved up to uh, a four after the war, and the four-cylinder had an overhead camshaft uh, engine, which was unusual for its time. Okay. Yeah, Crosley was okay. also making a whole family of vehicles, of, this, of which this is one of them. Uh, very popular configurations for general use were sedans, and also station wagons, or what we would call a wagon. Um, but the pickup was something that's really unusual to even see back then, let alone now. Uh, so this is a really unusual vehicle. Thanks very much for bringing it by. Did you mention the panel version? No. Yeah, there was a panel version of it too, a panel, panel type truck. No, yeah, we got, is this a, another 56 Ford? F-100 pickup. Okay, this, this F-100 was brought in by Peter and Jan Biddle of Trenton, Michigan. Uh, now this kind of looks like the Ford pickup that I would normally see. Um, this one has a shorter wheelbase. It's a lighter F-100 series. And you can again see the wraparound windshield and how modern the cab looks. Um, compared to some of the older trucks that paraded by before. Uh, now, Ford later called this pickup box flare side, but this is how they all were um, at the beginning. Uh, you'll notice that the side of the pickup box actually flares out and contains stake pockets, so you can build up the side of the um, pickup box for heavier loads. Uh, the pickup box is rather narrow. The fenders are exposed. Uh, this would change in 1957 when Ford started offering a choice of flare side and style side. And the style sides were smooth sided. The, uh, the uh, contours of the pickup box blended right in with the cab doors and front fender. And uh, it was a styling concept that General Motors had brought out about a year or two years earlier in mid 55. And that's the way pickups have evolved since then. You can tell that this was a uh, sort of a first aid uh, job because they put the wraparound windshield in in 56 and there was also an available wraparound rear window but there weren't a lot of them built that way. And they also revised the instrument panel for that one year of 1956. Uh, so even when you sat inside the cab you saw a lot of difference. Um, I recall seeing a lot of these pickups from this era on job sites when I was growing up because our neighborhood was being built up at the time. And I always thought those taillights were really kind of neat because they were in the shape of the Ford Crest. Uh, the Ford Crest is also on the hood and Ford used a slightly different design on the truck side compared to the passenger car side. It had a gear and lightning bolt in the middle of it, <laughs> which was very trucky. Well, thank for, thanks for bringing this around and uh, Look forward to your continued support. Oh, it's a V8, all right. <laughs> a Y8. Oh, that's right, yeah. Well, I'm a fan of, of free-rolling sirens or coaster sirens. I don't really like the electronic squawkers, but the fire departments apparently do because they get people out of the way faster. Okay. Uh, this is a 1972 Ford C-Series, C900, brought in by Stephen and Jesse Dage, Bingham Farms, Michigan. Now, despite it having the fire truck body, uh, we have to point out that the C-Series, which is the flat Based tilt cab was one of Ford's longest running truck series, even car series of all time. Uh, Ford came up with this design to replace the old cab over engine design, and they introduced it in 1957. And I think they produced it till 1980, Jim. Yeah, 
Yeah, at least till 1980. That was a... Did it go clear to 1990? I think it went... Yeah, yeah. 1990, and, so that's... I'm 10 years short. And the man that drove the last one off the line at Louisville was the same guy that drove the first one off in 1957. Anyway, uh, you have told me before that this... Uh, this particular truck does not have its original Ford engine. It's got, what, a Detroit diesel in it? Oh, a Caterpillar, okay. Well, Ford used Caterpillar uh, diesels in some of their uh, fire trucks at the time, but uh, the uh, gas-powered 534 cubic inch Ford truck uh, was extremely popular for a while, but they were real gas hogs, uh, both the, both going to the fire and then if they were sitting there being pumped, uh, pumping, they'd have to be refueled on the spot. So the switch to diesel fire engines has made a lot of sense. We still enjoy seeing this. And uh, 30 years ago, uh, every fire department had a truck like this, or any fire department of any size. And you can see why this cab design stayed in production for so long is because it's so practical. Notice that very little of the cab, it's mostly over the wheels, and so much of the frame contains the actual body. Uh, so you could have a real short cab dimension and maximize your payload, or in this case, your fire body. Okay, thanks for bringing it in again this year. Thank you. <laughs> well, the device on board is called a squirt, which is a, uh, a long-reach uh, substitute for a hose, I guess you could say. Well, that concludes our presentation for commercial vehicles for this year. And uh, on behalf of my partner, Jim Wagner, and I'm Roger Witkovich, uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, we'll see you later in the day with the cars, the 50s.